Naval Stories podcast. Hi, everybody. I'm Alexander Ostinov. I'm Alexander Uvarov. You're listening to the Naval Stories podcast, and we've come up with quite a funny description of it. A relatively historical podcast. Today, we're going to talk about an operation that took place in Narvik, Norway. But first, a forward. On December 31st, 1939, the British Chief of Staff's Committee recommended that troops be landed in Scandinavia, Norway in particular. So on April 7th, 1940, the main forces of the Metropolitan Fleet were deployed in the Northern Sea. They were tasked with covering the troops that were bound for Scandinavia towards Norway on transport ships. The landing of British troops, Allied troops in Norway, was scheduled for April 10th. But it wasn't meant to be. On April the 2nd, the German army had received a code signal to launch an operation with a name that can be translated as Exercises at Wesser. Did I say the name correctly? Weserübung in German. Weserübung. As part of this, on April 9th, 1940, German troops disembarked at all Norwegian ports. Why was Norway such a focus of attention for both the Allies and Germany? Firstly, I would like to note that the Germans landed their troops just a day ahead of the arrival of the British. Moreover, a clash wasn't intended. They weren't aware of each other's plans. It was a coincidence. An accident? Yes, a coincidence. Great Britain and Germany had similar reasons for their interest in Norway. Germany primarily wanted to secure their trade routes which were used to transport iron ore from Sweden. Mm-hmm. They also thought that the advantageous geostrategic location of Norway would give the German Navy the upper hand in the war at sea. Their ships would be able to sail to the northern Atlantic without hindrance, or at least very little risk. They would be able to deploy raiders and submarines, and more significantly, conduct a large-scale naval war, one that could possibly have been very successful. The British were interested in Norway for the same reasons. They wanted to cut off the German trade routes, to block those iron ore supplies, and by doing so, provoke an industrial collapse. By capturing Norway, Great Britain would have the power to blockade the German Navy in their own ports. I mean, the British would be geographically closer to the German ports and be able to tie their operations down. Last but not least, another factor, the Norwegian merchant fleet. It held the fourth place by tonnage in the world. This is important. Britain, as an island country, was very interested in it. They were highly dependent on sea transportation. These are the main factors that made Norway interesting for both Britain and Germany. Okay, then. Okay. Why Narvik? It's the northmost port, and its population was around 18,000 people at that time. It's a port. That's what was important. A port that didn't freeze over. The thing is, the iron ore shipments from Sweden to Germany went via the northern ports of Sweden. They would freeze in the Baltic Sea. Yeah. Narvik was the only northern Norwegian port that didn't freeze over. Moreover, A railway connected it to an iron ore deposit in Sweden. Yeah. Yeah. Cargo vessels transported iron ore to Germany all year round. The Germans took a huge risk by capturing Narvik. Even planning a landing in Narvik in general was risky. During Operation Weser Übung, when they landed in Oslo, Trondheim and Bergen, they had air support. As for Narvik, German aviation couldn't reach it. So the ships that carried the troops bound for Narvik didn't have any air support. They could easily have found themselves in serious trouble. Let's return to the events of April 9, 1940. Ten destroyers were under the command of Kapitan Zur C. Frederick Bonte. They were sailing toward Norway, towards Narvik. One of them lagged behind and arrived later. They approached the Ofot Fjord. 
which leads to Narvik, and landed troops at the spot where Norwegian shore batteries should have been located. However, Norway hadn't had time to complete them. The Germans were quite disappointed by that because they'd intended to capture the batteries and use them against the Allies if they tried to take Narvik for themselves. As for the Norwegian Army's warehouses, these turned out to be easy pickings for the Germans. The battalion that was supposed to guard them had been redeployed to Narvik a day prior. After this, the German destroyers moved towards Narvik itself. On their way, they met some Norwegian patrol ships and gave them an opportunity to surrender. The Norwegians accepted this offer and surrendered, but they had time to send a radiogram about the German ships moving toward Narvik. The ironclads that defended the city received this signal and knew about the approaching German destroyers. At four o'clock in the morning, the German destroyers approached the fjord, and at 8.10 a.m., General Dietl, who was in command of the Mountain Division, reported that Narvik had been captured. So it turns out that the Norwegians, those hyped-up Vikings, didn't put up a fight at all, basically. Now, that's where you're wrong. The full story of the Narvik landings was quite dramatic and tragic. I'll tell it to you over a cup of tea. OK. Early in the morning of April the 9th, the German squadron was discovered by two Norwegian Coast Guard ironclads. The Germans sent an envoy to one of them. He gave the Norwegians the option to lay down their arms and said that the destroyers were on a friendly mission. Of course, the Norwegians categorically refused the offer. The envoy left on his cutter and launched a red signal flare on his way back to the destroyer. The Germans torpedoed the first ironclad, breaking her in half. Only six members of her crew survived. The second ironclad was torpedoed mere minutes later and capsized. That was it for the naval defense of Narvik. It's worth saying that the Norwegians did everything in their power, of course. But the most interesting happened later that same day, April the 9th, when the Germans had already landed in Narvik. A Norwegian Coast Guard ship, armed with a single 47mm gun, sank a German tanker. This had a considerable impact on all the subsequent events. It was a specialized vessel with equipment that facilitated the quick refueling of ships. If it had arrived at Narvik, the Germans would have been able to quickly refuel and leave before the British arrived in force. So, in the afternoon of April the 9th, the world learned that German troops had landed in Norway and the country was going to be occupied. The British learned that there were enemy troops in Narvik. Battlecruiser Renown's squadron was near Narvik at that time, and five destroyers detached from it, the second destroyer flotilla under Commodore Bernard Warburton Lee. They approached the Offord Fjord in the evening, and Warburton Lee decided to use the element of surprise. The British ships managed to arrive at Narvik undetected thanks to bad weather. The Germans didn't suspect a thing. Warburton Lee sent a radiogram to the First Lord of the Admiralty. I'm going to attack at dawn, in keeping with the best traditions of Nelson. Yes, it was in keeping the highest traditions of the Royal Navy. As for the Germans, four destroyers were waiting in the harbour of Narvik. Two of them were lying at anchor, the other two were refuelling. The only remaining tanker at their disposal for refuelling had very slow equipment, and the entire process took quite a long time. Three more German destroyers were waiting in a neighboring field. Another two destroyers were located in a different neighboring field. All the destroyers weren't positioned around Narvik, and they weren't expecting an attack. The same night on April 9th, the German flotilla commander Frederick Bonte received a radiogram from a submarine about five British ships being detected in the West Field, close to Narvik. He didn't pay much attention to this information. I wonder, was it carelessness or arrogance? 
I think maybe it was carelessness, or perhaps a mere lack of experience, because it was the first serious naval operation. In fact, it was quite successful. So there were many factors that influenced his decision. Anyway, we'll never find it out. This secret died with him. I think it's like in any big war. You gain experience at great cost. This was the first great cost for the Germans. Another example, due to miscommunication, destroy a roader, which was patrolling the surrounding area, considered her task to be complete and returned to Narvik 10 minutes before the British ships burst into the port. I believe these cases are pretty much two of a kind. On April the 10th, 1940, three destroyers, Hardy, as the flagship under command of Captain Warburton Lee, Hunter and Havoc burst into the harbour of Narvik, launching torpedoes and opened artillery fire, causing German flagship Wilhelm Heidkamp to blow up and erupt in flames. Commander Friedrich Bonter was killed on board that ship. Another German destroyer, Schmidt, was also sunk. The other German ships in the port suffered significant damage. But interestingly, the tanker that had been used for refueling, Jan Wellem, Jan Wellem she remained intact. Not even a scratch. Later, two more British destroyers joined the fray. All five destroyers opened fire and unleashed hell upon the transport ships moored in Narvik. As a result, eight ships were sunk. One of them was British, by the way. Captain Warburton Lee considered his mission complete and left the battlefield with his fleet. Now let's talk about the Germans. Five remaining German destroyers were positioned in the fields on both sides of the harbour of Narvik. Having received a radio signal, they rushed to rescue their allied ships and ran into the British. This happened at about 7 o'clock. The weather was still bad, but the British and Germans were able to spot one another. One group of Germans saw the British at a distance. The British ships drifted off, of course, and encountered two more German destroyers. Warburton Lee thought there were no more German destroyers in the area. Like a true gentleman, he inquired about the ship's identities. Where are you from, guys? Yeah, who are you and what are you doing here? He received focused fire in response. Shells damaged the tower, bridge, control cabin and front bow gun, all destroyed. A shell hit a boiler room, blowing a boiler and instantly killing 17 people. People. The ship suffered a huge hull breach. Warburton Lee was mortally wounded. Hunter was struck by torpedoes from Thiel. She lost control and suddenly turned. Hotspur rammed into her at full speed. Bound together, they fell under heavy fire from the Germans. And those three destroyers were still approaching. Meanwhile, Hardy lost speed and hit the shore. Minus one destroyer. Yes, Hardy was a complete disaster. When the British destroyers disengaged, Hunter went to the bottom right away. Hunter went to the bottom right away. Hotspur tried to escape, but it didn't mean that the British were easy prey. Not at all. They fired in response. Yes, they responded. Thiel lost her guns and fire control systems. She was set on fire. Arnim also took five hits. Both ships left the battle. Respectively, Eric Bay, who had taken command after Bonte died, also left the battle. He realized that there was no point in pursuing the British ships. The Germans were running out of fuel. True, their fuel was almost spent. They also say that he demonstrated a lack of resolve. Well, this lack of resolve is quite understandable. He didn't know what was coming. Due to the poor visibility, it was in entirely unclear what they might meet when chasing those Brits. If they encountered active resistance, he would lose his remaining ships. Yes, I, I think that's why he made the decision to stop pursuing the British destroyers. This happened at 7.30. The duration of the entire battle, starting from when the British attacked Narvik, was two hours. So the score is two to two. By ships. By destroyed ships, yes. 
gas in the British and the Germans had each lost two ships. As for damaged ships, the Brits had the lead. They had only one damaged ship. Yes, the Germans had three. Talking about personal losses, they were somewhat equal. Also, commanders from both sides were killed in action. Yes. By the way, both received crosses posthumously. Each of them in their own homeland. Yes, they were awarded medals. Awarded cross medals. Warburton Lee got the Victoria Cross. And Bonto was awarded the Iron Cross. In conclusion, the British destroyers sank a German supply vessel that was carrying ammunition for the German destroyers. This made a great impact on what happened afterward. By the evening of April 10th, the Germans had only two destroyers remaining afloat. Zenker and Gies, having refueled their tanks, they made an attempt to break through the enemy line. However, they encountered superior British forces at the fjord's mouth and were forced to retreat. The next day, Gies's engines failed. Zenker deformed her propeller against the sea bottom, and the newly repaired Kolner suffered damage from colliding with sunken rocks. There was no way to break through. Defence was their only option. What defence? They were trapped there. By defence, I mean ambush tactics. The German destroyers met the approaching British ships with torpedoes and artillery fire. That was their tactic. On Saturday, April the 13th, after lunch, battleship Warspite entered the Offutt Fjord, accompanied by nine destroyers. She was detected by two German destroyers. Kölner and Kühner. It's worth mentioning that Kuhn accompanied Kölner to the ambush spot. Kölner was seriously damaged, and she was supposed to be hidden somewhere at the entrance to the Offutt Fjord, a position that would enable her to effectively launch torpedoes and strike the enemy. But they could see the British ships, and they had to find an ambush spot right where they stood, where they had spotted the enemy. Well, yeah, at that exact spot. Meanwhile, an onboard swordfish aircraft took off from Warspite. The aircraft detected Kölner as she was lurking in the wait for the British, dropped two bombs, and sank a German submarine that was in a stationary position, very close to the destroyer. The Germans had been spotted, and their ambush plans were in tatters. Three British destroyers approached that position sometime later. Their guns were already trained on Kölner's position. The destroyers opened heavy fire at the German ship. The Germans fought back, but they were left with just a single bow gun after a mere 10 minutes of the battle. That was their last remaining gun. Yes, the last they had. The Germans continued to fire their one gun. The British requested Warspite's assistance. The battleship literally tore the German destroyer apart with her 381 mm armor-piercing shells from a distance of three kilometers. Poor destroyer. The shells didn't even have time to arm over such a short distance. You mean the shells simply broke the ship apart without exploding? Yes, that's right. As a result, 70 people died. The ship was torn apart. At the same time, Eric Bay commanded all five of his remaining destroyers to engage the enemy. Two flotillas met in the Offot Fjord, quite a narrow fjord. A classic destroyer battle commenced in the North Sea. The ships were moving in circles, maneuvering, and trying to hit each other. Right. The British also launched around 10 bombers from aircraft carrier Furious. Yes, bombers were involved in that battle as well. What a mess. The bombers weren't able to hit any destroyers due to their skillful maneuvering. The Germans managed to shoot down two bombers, but they were running low on ammunition. The transport vessel had been sunk. The British had sent their compliments to the Führer. As a result, the Germans ran out of ammo, and Bay ordered his ships to retreat. They left for Narvik in an organized manner. Destroyer Kun hadn't noticed the signal, and being left without ammo, she retreated in another direction and escaped to a neighboring field. The crew mined the ship, and she should have exploded. But in the same moment, HMS Eskimo entered the field and launch torpedoes. What still remains unknown and will probably always remain a mystery is what actually caused the destroyer to explode. 
Was it the mines set by her crew or the torpedoes? Anyway, the ship was destroyed. An interesting fact. In the heat of the battle, destroyer Zenka was able to get close enough to Warspite to launch a two-torpedo salvo at her. Imagine if they'd hit their target. I think that would have dealt pretty serious damage to the battleship, but it wouldn't have been the end for her. It seems to me that the hit would have had an impact on the battle regardless of whether the Germans sank Warspite or not. A psychological attack, because, well, the Germans hit Warspite with torpedoes. It's possible that they wouldn't have noticed that in the heat of the battle. I mean the Germans, because they were already retreating. All in all, the Germans withdrew from combat in quite an organized way. They had almost completely run out of ammo. The Germans mined two destroyers that had no ammunition to fight back. Meanwhile, a repaired Gies engaged the enemy. She moved directly towards the British. The ship had ammunition for a mere 10 minutes of the fight. She used up her entire ammo stock. She was hit by all of her adversaries and became engulfed in flames. The crew had abandoned the ship before she sank. After 3 p.m., destroyer Cossack rushed into the harbour of Narvik, supported by battleship Warspite. She spotted destroyer Dieter von Roder, which was stationed at the landing pier. The British warship tried attacking her, but Roder welcomed the British with heavy and accurate artillery fire. The fire was so heavy that Cossack slowed down and ran aground. So the British ship was hit? That's right. The crew suffered losses of around 10 people, either dead or wounded. Waspite then joined the corps and set about the task of destroying Rhoda. As it goes, with any battleship when they fire at such small targets, Waspite demolished the port and city structures but never hit Rhoda. Like the joke Tarantino tells in the movie Desperado, those who remember will get it. Yes, absolutely. She didn't hit the glass. The Germans abandoned Rhoda, which had also used up her entire ammo stock. But the main reason for the crew to scuttle their ship was that British destroyer Foxhound was approaching them. So the German crew made a plan. When the British approached, when Foxhound approached Rhoda, they would detonate both ships. So Foxhound was approaching the German ship. But a mountain ranger couldn't resist the urge to fire a machine gun at the British ship from the shore. The British put two and two together and went astern of the German ship, so Foxhound wasn't damaged when Roder exploded. Meanwhile, in the Rombax Fjord, the fjord was close to the place where the battle between the Germans and British had broken out. Three British destroyers entered the fjord. Yes, but wait, before we talk about that, let me describe the setting. The Germans covered their retreat to the Rombax Fjord with smoke. Four destroyers remained. Two were already mined and ready to be scuttled, while the other two had a few remaining torpedoes. So these two German ships prepared an ambush for the approaching British ships. That's where the three British destroyers, Eskimo, Forrester and Hero, were heading. Thiel and Ludeman had some torpedoes on board, so they were lying in wait for the British. Thiel launched a torpedo salvo and severely damaged HMS Eskimo. Her bow end up to the second gun was demolished. Surprisingly, the ship remained afloat, but what's clear is that she was out of the battle. Naturally, Thiel immediately found herself under heavy fire from the British ships. The field was narrow, so it was very easy to run aground when moving to the left or right, especially when under fire. Thiel ran aground and broke into two parts. Ludman was retreating and being prepared for scuttling like Arnim and Zenka, which had already been rigged to explode. As a result, Arnim and Zenka exploded, but the explosives failed to go off on Ludman. The British boarded the ship, removed the German flag, raised the British flag and intended to deliver their trophy back to Britain, to their homeland. But then they understood that this would require too much fuss, so they simply finished the ship off with a torpedo. That's how the Battle of Narvik ended. That was the last German ship that took part in the operation. It's time to summarize it all.
Over the course of just a single day, on April the 13th, the Germans lost eight destroyers and a submarine. If you add the losses from April the 10th to that, you get 10 destroyers, precisely half of what the Kriegsmarine had. Those are some serious losses. The Kriegsmarine lost half of their destroyers over the course of this single campaign in this battle. The losses of the British were somewhat less. Two British destroyers were destroyed and two were badly damaged. Destroyed in the first battle? Yes, they were destroyed in the first battle. The damaged ships were promptly repaired and entered service again. Naturally, the German propaganda machine, basically, it was a defeat. Yeah, a defeat. But they managed to make it work to their advantage by claiming it was a heroic battle. The sailors were called heroes. The sailors who fought in that battle, in the Battle of Narvik. The most interesting part is that the initial mission, they occupied Narvik, and they fulfilled their mission. The Germans occupied Narvik. Sure, they lost half of their destroyers along the way. To be fair, we must admit that the Germans fought truly heroically. Yeah, they fought until their last shell was spent, to the last torpedo. Moreover, the survivors of the German warships then reinforced the land troops and fought as marines. In this campaign? Yes, in this very campaign. This campaign lasted for two more months, and it ended with the Allied forces occupying Narvik, but not for long. Because at the same time, the Allies suffered a defeat in France, so they had to fall back. Just two weeks after the Allies had entered Narvik, they had to leave it. The Germans marched through the almost entirely destroyed city once again. That's the whole story. No. Frankly speaking, the occupation of Norway eventually became a liability for the Germans. They had to keep quite a large task force there, 300,000 people, plus military vehicles. These could have been deployed on the eastern or western fronts. Exactly for the sole purpose of preventing the Allies from liberating Norway again. That's all we wanted to tell you about the Battle of Narvik. I'm Alexander Ostinov. I'm Alexander Uvarov. This was the Naval Stories podcast. In which we discuss various historical events. Leave your comments. Like the video? Subscribe to our channel. Bye. Bye. The Naval Stories Podcast.